Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Views, episode 202, and today I'm going to talk about Sonny Clark's album from 1958, Cool Strutton, released on Blue Note. This is a 2009 Blue Note reissue, which is pretty good, except for a little tiny bit of distortion here and there. So if you're going to pick this up on vinyl, I would do a little bit of research into the pressing before you select one. Sonny Clark's life was short and intense and contained an immense musical contribution, but unfortunately he never enjoyed much wealth or fame in his own lifetime. He is regarded as being amongst the very top grouping of hard bop piano players, and everything he does has a bit of a blues touch, particularly a minor blues touch, but he's very much squarely in the hard bop rather than the blues side of the ledger when we look at the whole jazz canon. This album is generally held to be his masterwork, but pretty much everything he did for Blue Note or for other labels was superb. Sonny Clark was born in July 1931 in Hermony Number no. 2, Pennsylvania. The number 2 refers to the second mine shaft of this coal company. There's a bigger town called Hermony. Anyway, Hermony Number no. 2 is about 25 miles east of Pittsburgh. And his family had moved up from Georgia. They had first moved to a place called Aliquippa. They were chased away by the Klan, so they moved to this other little company town, which I guess was a little more accepting, and his dad worked in the Coke factory associated to the coal mine. He had a pretty challenging upbringing. His dad died just two weeks after he was born of black lung, so he was raised by his mom and by his sisters. He was the youngest of eight kids. He was the only black kid in his whole grade. He's also quite small of stature. As a grown man, he was five foot three. So he had a lot of things to overcome, but he could play the piano like a hot damn. And already as a kid, by eight or nine years old, he was playing in the local hotel and getting a fair degree of local fame for doing so. As Sonny got into his late teens, his mom also got quite sick, and the family eventually falls apart and disperses, and he follows a brother out to California, originally to visit an aunt, but then he ends up sticking around because the music scene in L.A. is just fantastic, well, compared to Hermione No. 2, Pennsylvania. Once out in L.A., it doesn't take him too long to get known in the local jazz scene, such as his talent. It also doesn't take him too long to get involved in heroin, which, of course, was such a scourge of so many players around this time. He joins the saxophonist Wardell Gray, and along with Gray and Teddy Charles, he makes his recording debut in 1953 on an album called Teddy Charles' West Coasters. He then joins a band led by the clarinet player Buddy DeFranco. He makes a couple of records there, and then he makes his own recording debut in 1955 with a trio in Oakland, which doesn't actually get released until 1995, and you can pick it up on CD. It's called Oakland 1955, somewhat conveniently. In the mid-50s, he also backs up Dinah Washington. He plays with Serge Chaloff, including on that fantastic record of Chaloff's Blue Surge, and he also plays with Sonny Crisp. He moves to New York in the spring of 1957, and just as when he went to L.A., his talent does the talking. Pretty soon, he's on a Blue Note session, June 23rd of that year, for Hank Mobley. And Alfred Lyon, the label proprietor, is so impressed with him that he signs him up to be a leader in his own right. He records his debut for Blue Note, Dial S for Sonny, in July of that year. In September, he makes Sonny's Crib, which has an amazing lineup, including Donald Byrd, Paul Chambers, and little-known sideman saxophonist John Coltrane, who, of course, had been kicked out of Miles Davis's group in the spring for his heroin addiction, essentially, had cleaned up, but was not yet back in Miles' good graces, and was in the middle of that amazing six-month engagement with Thelonious Monk at the five spot. Anyway, Clark has the great timing to pick him up at that point as a sideman. Clark also records the album The Sonny Clark Trio in October with Paul Chambers again and also with Philly Joe Jones, who also appears on this. And then in early January, he makes this record. What I've mentioned here are just the records that came out around that time, but there's a whole bunch of other sessions that he contributes to in this period, which end up going out on both his own releases and other people's releases around this time. So incredibly prolific, incredibly productive at this point. He ends up making a total of 11 records as a leader, not all, but most, with Blue Note. And in his time at Blue Note, he's basically the house pianist. As a consequence, he plays with all kinds of incredible names. In addition to the people I've mentioned, these include people like Dexter Gordon, Jackie McLean, Hank Mobley, Stan Getz, the list goes on and on. He's a regular sideman for Jackie McLean, who's also on this record, and also for the guitarist Grant Green. So in some respects, the world was at Sonny Clark's feet in the late 1950s and early 1960s, except that it wasn't because he himself was in the grip of heroin. He had overdosed a few times already by the time he had a fatal overdose in January 1963 at the age of 31. The news of his death was related to his family by Baroness Nika de Koningswarter, the great patron of all things jazz in New York in the late 50s and early 1960s. She also paid for his funeral, but it's not actually clear that the person who's buried in his grave in Pennsylvania is actually Sonny Clark, because people at the service said they didn't recognize him, and it is highly likely that he is actually buried in an unmarked grave in Hart Island in New York, which is where so many street casualties who were unidentified ended up. 
This record is made on January the 5th, 1958, in Rudy Van Gelder's parents' living room in Hackensack, New Jersey, with Alfred Lyon producing. Clark is on piano, Jackie McLean is on alto sax, on bass is Paul Chambers, that mainstay of the first great Miles Davis quintet, who himself would die very young of complications related to drug addiction in 1969 at age 33. Another key player from Miles Davis' rhythm section, Philly Joe Jones, is here on drums, and Art Farmer is here on trumpet. The only one of these five players, incidentally, as we're talking of heroin, who didn't actually have a major battle with heroin throughout his career. He, of course, was a friend of Clark's from their California days, and he's produced very interestingly here, typically speaking, on records where Rudy Van Gelder is the engineer, the instruments sound very close, very present, almost immediately like two feet in front of you. Uh, Farmer's solos have a fair amount of reverb at points applied to them, which sounds great, but it's just very different from what one normally expects. The remarkable ankles belonging to the woman in the pencil skirt on the front cover of this record are those of Ruth Lyon, who is quite a significant figure in jazz history. The photo is taken by Frank Wolf, who was Alfred Lyon's partner in Blue Note. She was earlier known as Ruth Mason. She moved to New York. She became a jazz DJ, and a very well-known jazz DJ in New York, which I think is probably no mean achievement for a woman in 1944 or 1945 to get that kind of status in what is a highly male, no doubt highly misogynistic environment in the jazz world. She meets Lion and Wolf. Lion and she fall in love, and she becomes the office manager in charge of artist relations, basically does everything it needs doing for Blue Note Records for a whole, probably 10 or 15 years, including modeling on several different record covers. Eventually, in 1967, she can see that Alfred, who has been running this label for two decades plus and is really getting worn out, and she knows he has a bad ticker, is going to drop dead pretty soon if she doesn't find a way to get him to cool his heels. So she persuaded him to retire. They moved to Mexico for 12 years, and that point really is the point at which, even though Frank Wolf took over and others took over after that and they were talented people, the label really ceases to be classic Blue Note after 1967, after Alfred Lyon's departure. Side One has two tracks, both of which are written by Clark, and the first of those is Cool Strutton, the title track. Interesting from the very get-go because there's this polyrhythmic counterpoint between the way Clark is comping underneath the head arrangement and the head arrangement itself, stated by the two horn players Farmer and McLean. Clark takes the first solo. He's incredibly fluid. He's got this light touch like a babbling brook. It just seems effortless, and you can hear these direct lines back to Monk, particularly the witty parts of Monk, the little notes that he'll throw in just kind of make you raise your eyebrows. Those are very much here in Clark's playing. The fluidity of Powell. Anyway, it's genius, but it's also genius that's standing on the shoulders of giants, that makes sense. The second Clark track on side one is Blue Minor, which starts off with a McLean solo, which is far more impactful than the one he'd had in the first track, and it just feels like he's feeling this track more. Farmer, the same thing. This is often said to be the quintessential hard bop album, and I think this is a quintessential hard bop track on this record. Side two starts with Sippin' It Bells, which is an old Miles Davis track, which he'd done with Charlie Parker. This is one of those blues hard bop numbers, which is clearly a blues in terms of the chord structures, but the changes are so distinct and so uncharacteristic of what you and I would normally consider to be something that sounds like the blues that I often wonder exactly how helpful that characteristic is. Anyway, McLean's playing on this is fantastic, better I think than even the things he did in the first side, which were pretty good. Again, he was a huge acolyte, of course, of Parker, and it really shows who's playing here. Side two closes with Deep Night, which is an old swing era standard in the minor key, and it's a great one. And it's actually, I think, probably my favorite track of this whole record. It's got changes which are very similar to Blue Skies, which is one of my favorite pre-war tracks. And Farmer and McLean particularly are loving this track and are the real stars of it. This record is pure 1958 unadulterated hard bop. There's nothing modal here. There's nothing free. There's nothing avant-garde, nothing particularly challenging to the ear. We're still a good year away from all of that. What there simply is, is spectacular playing from a spectacular lineup. Clark, in particular, is the glue for the whole record. He plays incredibly fluidly and at a super high technical level all the way through this whole record, but he never feels like he breaks a sweat. And I think that's why in an album that's got four really quite complex compositions of very interesting compositions, you're not left thinking this is some academic exercise the experience of the listener is just like you're sitting at a club just digging this great, great band. This is highly recommended, and it's five out of five stars.